Ja, on record three. Oh, yeah, I wouldn't mind to be the president of the country. <laughs> <laughs> we would love a woman president. No, I can't. I'm a woman who supports women. I, but, uh, love a woman I, I don't have a, nomi- a nomination there and I support uh, the nomination of President Ramaphosa for now. Hello and welcome to Politricking with T.D. Madia. My name is T.D. Madia. This is episode 10 of season 2 of a politics podcast brought to you by Eyewitness News. So about that panel report, eh? That section 89 independent panel that delivered a report so damning that it thrust the country into chaos. I think it did. A little bit. So... On Wednesday last week, the Section 89 committee then finally hands over its work into the Palapal investigation to Speaker Nosivue Mapisa Ngakula. That evening, that report was then made public. Can I tell you, I can count the amount of days where I've had a full eight hour sleep since that day. That very night, I was stuck waiting and calling and calling and receiving WhatsApps, being added to WhatsApp group after WhatsApp group. This as people in the ANC, allies of the president, detractors of the president, were trying to make sense of what the potential next step could be following that particular report. Um, it's been a very interesting couple of days. I do think the country was thrust into some sort of chaos or semi-chaos. I mean... When the conversation is, will the president resign or not resign? When OB vans from the public broadcaster are parked outside waiting for a public address, what else could it be, right? We didn't get the public address. (laughs) Surprise, surprise. But anyway, going back to the panel report. So the panel then says the president may have a case to answer for as far as an impeachment is concerned. It found that he may have violated the Constitution, may have violated the rule of law, and possibly committed gross misconduct, right? By placing himself in an area, exposing himself really, to something that is in conflict with the duties and responsibilities that lie on his shoulders as head of state. So it is that that we've been dealing with. And you deal with it from multiple fronts. It's not just about, oh, will the president resign? But the president is also president of the governing party. So you'll deal with it in parliament, where these reports come from. You will deal with it in the ANC, where he is the party president. And the ANC, mind you, is just weeks, no, scrap that, days away from its elective conference where this man was sitting pretty. This man was pretty much headed for re-election. That's it, days away. So all of this is happening as we are marching towards Nazarek 2, as they call it, the ANC's 55th National Elective Conference. It also happens, it also plays itself out, rather, In the courts, because now he's filed for a review. So we turn our attention, and we will turn our attention, to the Constitutional Court to see how that plays out. By virtue of being president, before you ask, hey, why not a high court? By virtue of being a president, matters about his conduct lie pretty much with the Constitutional Court. So it's not even a question of direct access. It's a question of that's where the matter belongs. That's what I understand. I'm not a jurist. I know nothing. I just know that little bit. And then it will play itself out in society where you and I will try and make sense of what the panel recommendations and findings mean, how the ANC is handling this matter, how Ramaphosa himself withers the storm. And I'm not sure if I'm satisfied, right? I don't explain what it is. I think first, let me speak about society. I'm a little bit unhappy with us. I think we are in a precarious space position state of being as society, as a country, as citizens. And I say that because when a scandal like this breaks out about the president, that's when you up the ante as far as scrutiny is concerned, where you demand accountability and answers, and if needs be, his head as president. That's not what we've been doing. Instead, we really have been 
taking sorrow. We've been feeling sorry for the president, feeling very upset and very worried about ourselves. I recognize that we are anxious. I work for a company where I saw my colleagues being anxious, my family being anxious about the future. It felt like a very uncertain space when you're hearing that the president might just all willingly and he just quit. Call it a quit because hey, you like It is concerning. But I also worry that when people start saying, I also worry when people start saying things like, it's not your money anyway. It's fine. He's the better devil. Then I worry because that speaks to our prospects, right? Does that make sense? It's not just about Rama Paz. Unfortunately for him, or fortunately, whichever way you want to cut it, whatever's happening now for me is not about the individual. It's got to be about beyond him. You know, he's taking the matter on review, and part of it is that something so important must be tested in the highest court in the land because it has such dire consequences on our democracy itself. So that's what I think about, you know? So I'm struggling a little bit with our response, even the fourth estate, eh? Because I've heard you guys also complaining about how you'll take on the NC. Now, this is just society, but the members of the media, where you say things like, it's not your money anyway, louring, where you say, call it BS, drama, post, I'm a stream. What are we saying? We tend to turn a blind eye on the president, you know. I think members of the media ban large fan and now with the president when he became party president in 2017. And you're still insisting on driving this narrative. And I think you fail. And you fail the country. You fail us as, as, a, as a fraternity. But most importantly, you even fail the leader when you allow him to get away with murder. And I'm not saying Ramaphosa is guilty. The panel itself is not. It says there may be a case... I think he must allow processes to unfold. I understand that if he had to allow himself to be subjected to an impeachment process, it'll be bruising. And not just on him, but him and the ANC ahead of an election. Yeah, I get all of those things. But I'm worried just about your our reaction, guys. Like, and I think that that's a problem. We need to maybe assess our understanding of expectations on our leaders a little bit differently. In terms of our prayer in the NC, it was also very interesting. It's also why I haven't had much sleep, actually. Literally, political football. What else could you expect? Um, I think Ramaphosa's supporters went to ground. His allies, reasons why I was not sleeping. They were caught in meetings until all wee hours. All locked up in meetings about what to do. The way you feel sorry for him right now how he feels like a victim believe me that's also part of the strategy the intention is to make him look like our sham our sister our poor president who's doing the right thing he's a politician he might not have bargained for how hectic this term of office might might, might have been i've asked him about the term of office and how he thinks he's fed so i do recognize that that he might not have expected it to be this tough and yay it's been a tough five years that I can give him. And I think as you scrutinize and as I say, yay, you're wrong for just playing victim. And yay, I do recognize that while I say don't fall for the gimmick, I do think it's important to recognize that he's done some good things in leadership. He has attempted to re establish many 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 broken departments he has tried to look at institutions i don't think it will be fair to take that from him but also as i slam him and his people let me tell you about his opponents the ones who are running around with the cabinet list because it was so sure yeah when you smell blood so much that you are clumsy in your actions and you are so obvious to those who are looking at you about what you're attempting to do Hey, NC. And that's the thing about them ultimately is that this is just this desperate need to power grab at all cost. That the politics, the palace politics always come first. With Ramaphosa, though, I must very quickly flag that he's not done. His people walked out of that, ooh, they walked out of that NEC meeting with smiles because they won the arguments of the day and they've managed to buy time. They've managed to outmaneuver his opponents. But he's not done. That NEC will sit again. There's another NEC, rather, that's sitting again at the end of the week. And there, that Integrity Commission report is expected to be tabled. I'm interested in finding out, I think as many are who are following politics, what it will contain, whether it will tell them to step aside. Because that thrusts him right back into more chaos, right back into a quagmire where he must come up with another strategy to fight for his life. The parliamentary aspect of the story is that it will play itself out next week back in parliament. The ANC has given a line of march to its MPs saying reject 
this particular report. And they use the basis of the fact that he's gone to apply for a review in the con court for that. I have a big issue with the ANC that does that, considering the State Capture Commission report and what it says is being done wrong by MPs and putting party interests ahead of those of the citizens of the country. Right? Does that make sense? Anyway, so my guest this week is somebody I've been looking for for a very long time. She's been making promises to come to the podcast it's taken a very long time, as I said, for her to come. She seems to be one of those people in the ANC that they rely on when there's chaos. She seems to come in as a stabilizer, I think. I wrote about her at the beginning of the year saying, hey, there are murmurs that Dr. Gwen Ramukhopa will be deployed to Lutuli House. It is a strategic move by Ramaphosa's lieutenants. Yes. So that's who I have in the studio this week. She is a supporter, Yarama Posa. So we spoke a little bit about that, but also spoke about many other things. Take a listen. So we have been speaking to different ANC leaders over the past, what, few months? Because the party is holding its 55th National Elective Conference. I've complained, and you know it. I've complained time and memorial about how so many men in the ANC are willing to come to the table, have conversations about themselves, about the party, and whether or not the party is still fit for purpose as far as South Africa's needs, challenges are concerned. I'm very happy today because I've got Dr. Gwen Ramukhopa in studio. Yes, we managed to get her to come to Prime Media. And she it's an interesting story for me around Dr. Gwen because... I remember hearing murmurs about how she's going to go to Lutulia House and how this is an important matter, this particular development. And I think for a while, there was the only journalist who was focusing on the story around Gwen Ramukho. But where is it going? What is it? And eventually I spoke to her about it as well. And you know, it came to four. She was at Lutulia House. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us. Ask, ask Gwen. Thank you very much, um, um, my dear, and uh, thanks to the listeners. And I'm glad I'm in the primary studio. We are studio. happy you finally yes, came. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. L- let's thank start you with the me. aftermath. Let's start yes. with the crisis. Um, what is your sense of how the ANC is handled, the Palapala saga, following the release of that report and the NEC that was abruptly ended on Friday, right down to the one that happened on Monday, where the ANC took a position in terms of the direction that it wants its caucus to move in? Yeah, I actually thought that uh, the briefing has been uh, very in, in the immediate past and that that matter may not arise, but let me um, uh, uh, t- talk into it. Uh, first and foremost, uh, this matter didn't take South Africans by surprise. That's the first thing. Uh, it has been in the media for quite some time and we are aware that uh, there are many institutions of law that are investigating uh, independently and also from uh, our own side as the ANC, the integrity committee is seized with the matter. Uh, already we have uh, the last uh, ordinary meeting of the ANC, of the NEC, agreeing that the integrity committee must come and talk into their report, um, uh, which uh, is uh, scheduled for the 9th of uh, this month. Uh, in the intervening period, uh, we were expecting the, the report of the panel, uh, Section 89 um, mm. uh, panel, and um, it could have gone either way. Uh, however, um, and we were ready for it going either way. If the uh, president had anything uh, to answer to, um, uh, uh, he has to, uh, and uh, he had to, and that was also his position which we supported and which is our policy, that personal matters must not bring down uh, the integrity uh, and of of the African National Congress and of uh, of government uh, for our deployees. But if it had gone the other way where he was cleared, obviously we would have uh, uh, jubilated. However, the report that came out at face value, it was saying something to answer. But on further analysis, including by many a jurist, many experts, uh, Tulima Donsela, uh, retired Judge Murphy, uh, Ma, uh, Rama, po- I mean, uh, Posa, you know, Matthews Posa, and heard his Matthews comments, po- yes. Posa, uh, Matole Motsecha, and others, uh, they were saying, uh, this is not good enough uh, to uh, put before the nation and say these are 
uh, this is a, a validated reasons why a president should be impeached. So that's also what caused first a meeting that, yes, we agree, was called impromptu. And uh, the NEC said, no, 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 uh, process it properly. And then the, we had to process it properly. And yesterday's outcome um, was clear and communicated to the nation that um, based on uh, the fact that the president himself uh, has taken the matter on uh, review, um, you know, the, the, the panel report on review um, and the conclusions they have made, uh, then they, really there is uh, nothing before us to discuss. And we will certainly um, meet on the 9th. Uh, it was a scheduled meeting of the NEC. And uh, we will certainly receive the report of the Integrity Committee. Before I even look at that, as Gwen Ramukhopa, are you proud of the way the ANC has handled it? And let me just quickly say, the issue of a review is put on the table. I understand that. But the ANC that then says to its caucus, reject the, pal- the, the panel's report. At a time where the countries come from state capture, at a time where in that particular report, the recommendations from now Chief Justice Raymond Zondo is that what you have in parliamentarians are members who tow the party line and don't put the interests of the republic ahead of party considerations. The same report that then says we need MPs to work and to act in accordance with their conscience in light of the oath that they've taken in order to serve and be public representatives. As Gwen Ramokopa before me, are you proud of what the NEC has produced and pronounced on this week? If I was uh, an MP of the African National Congress, I will vote with my conscience and also party line because I have read the the, the, the report myself. I have reviewed the various um, uh, you know, comments by various uh, uh, persons, including other jurists. And um, I also would understand that uh, there are only three ways to vote. You either vote for, meaning that you start the impeachment process, um, despite the fact that there is a, a, a review application, or you vote against, um, uh, or you abstain. So if you abstain, you say, I don't have an opinion. And I don't Mm. think it is uh, reasonable for a leader to say in this important issue, you should not have an opinion. If you vote for, you are saying what uh, other jurists, eminent jurists are saying it is a flawed conclusion, should go through the process. So the, the most responsible way to vote uh, is to say uh, we, we we do not accept it in its form. Uh, and that is what uh, the NEC has uh, uh, put to the chief whip, who is a member also of the uh, NEC. Yes. And uh, we have no doubt that uh, the uh, caucus of the ANC will discuss the same. And um, if they come to a different conclusion, they can come back to the NEC. I, I take that. I take that. Um, the issue of the president of the country and president of the ANC. Um, what must happen with him? The issue around step aside, I think at this point in time, I also felt was a non-issue. Yes. But there is an integrity report that is coming, as you said. Yes. Should it recommend that he steps aside? What is your sense? Do you think that you will then easily, and this close to the national conference, agree that actually... Comrade Ramaphosa, please step aside. What is your view on what needs to happen? I, I, and you said earlier that you you kind of had a sense that the panel will go in a particular way. Do you have a sense of how the Integrity Commission Committee will rule on this? Well, I didn't uh, predict where which way the panel will go. I'm saying we, we were ready for the panel going either way. Uh, the Integrity Committee are also um, veterans, uh, in particular, of uh, uh, eminence. And uh, I have every confidence in their uh, conclusions. And um, the, uh, let's wait for them to advise us accordingly. Uh, they independently uh, take decisions, guide uh, the NEC, and we should accord them that uh, respect. If they recommend steps aside as an NEC member, where would you stand? 
I will deal with it when it comes, my dear. I think let's deal with it when it comes, uh, the reasons they will put. And if those reasons uh, are fair and uh, uh, what would actually protect the ANC's integrity, uh, we should agree with them. But if those reasons uh, uh, would not stand, for instance, if the reasons uh, in, in this case would be based on a report that is taken on review. I think you've also said that uh, uh, it would be uh, regrettable if they so decide. Uh, but we will engage with them and um, we will respect. We've always respected their rulings. And uh, we've agreed that they're independent and their rulings we will respect. And that's why we've made them independent. So let's not preempt them. Uh, however, uh, for everyone else, especially those who wishing Ramaphosa away for whatever reasons, Others wish him away because they just don't like him. They had other preferences. Others wish him or away because down on corruption others the wish them away because they're clamping down on corruption, regardless of political affiliation. His political parties. Recently, we have seen also, uh, you know, DA members uh, who have been arrested by the Hawks or whoever, or members of the public, um, professionals, and anyone else. Uh, if we don't like him for that, I think South Africans who uh, want law, order, and justice. Uh, and ethics and integrity to reign and to give us space uh, for development uh, will support him. And we've also seen um, and heard a lot of uh, members of uh, society saying uh, they agree that uh, the, uh, as yet there is no evidence and that they are concerned that uh, he's been targeted for his stance on corruption. And we see the, the results now. Uh, one thing that we must be proud of is that uh, uh, even uh, SARS the, has been rescued. It turned around. It was hallowed. Uh, so corruption was real. And um, the, we expect that the various uh, institutions uh, that are investigating and following through the report of the Zondo Commission will just do their, their, their work uh, without fear or favor. You know, there's a school of thought within the ANC that the issue of the Ramaphosa is not the issue of corruption. It is how the fight against the corrupt is playing itself out, that it's got eyes. It's almost be a step aside when you think about it. They say that it's got eyes and it works along and according to factional considerations. Some will say to you, He's shifting away from ANC policies. He's shifting towards the right, and that's not who or what the ANC wants to be. They even sometimes put it down to color, saying that black business with Ramaphosa at the helm is not the beneficiary of a lot of the contracts or opportunities. Let's call them opportunities that are out there, saying that um, he's somebody who remains aligned to big business, even in his approach as president of the country and the ANC. What says you? Uh, Sidi, I would like you to invite Ramaphosa to speak for himself <laughs> <laughs> on these main you must issues. Tell us you. But uh, at some point, I want like, to switch over to you. But I also this yes. is the issue that we're dealing with at the moment. You're an ANC member. Uh, that's okay. And I was so preempting my response. I was okay, preempting sorry, sorry, my let me, response. Let me, let me, let me, let me but I think space. it would be good for South Africans to hear Ramaphosa himself speak about uh, some of these um, uh, utterances and uh, allegations. However, uh, before I became an, an MEC for health, uh, I was part of uh, the medical doctors group, SMDP. I'm still part of them. And uh, I represented them in a committee called the Black a economic Empowerment Committee established by various uh, sectors uh, of society uh, at that time. And Ramaphosa was the chair. So he has been, uh, from my experience, and I was uh, his deputy. So from my experience, he has been at the helm of Black Economic Empowerment since. And if we can look at uh, the recent appointment of uh, the broad-based Black Economic Empowerment Commission, uh, it is strengthening a uh, transformation uh, of, the, of the sector. Anyone who would believe that uh, we can achieve inclusive econ e e growth or economic growth without the majority of South Africans being there and uh, uh, you know, productive. I think uh, the 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 are uh, misdirected, and I don't think the president believes so because uh, otherwise he wouldn't be a proponent of uh, economic growth and investment. We need a productive society, and it is not his policies. We've had a situation in the past where a president had uh, their own beliefs about a a policy, but the policy was uh, uh, of the ANC was different, and we say. 
stick to the policies of the ANC. First, I believe he, he believes in broad-based black economic empowerment uh, from his own track record. And secondly, I think if anyone thinks he doesn't believe it, but he's obliged to uh, implement the policies of the African National Congress. As he doesn't mm. give us interviews. He owes us a lot of interviews okay. as members of the media and ultimately as a, as, as a part of him accounting yes. to the citizens he serves. The president of the ANC fails and it's a commitment he made. So because you said we must ask him, yes. I'm going to ask you to please put in a word that can he actually avail himself for interviews? I will um, certainly do that. I want to wind down yeah. and move on from him. But before I do, do you continue having faith in him as a leader? In a few weeks time, in a few days time actually, the ANC goes to an elective conference should he stand still? There are um, at least five uh, principles uh, that guide me uh, in terms of uh, looking at uh, the leadership that must emerge. And these are the principles in, aligned to the our renewal agenda and um, transformation, radical socioeconomic transformation agenda. First and foremost is that we must have some continuity. Um, many institutions uh, die because they stop and start and stop and start. So at least let's uh, have uh, stability uh, in terms of continuity and uh, uh, President Ramaphosa happens to be a leader that has also gone uh, taken us through uh, the century as uh, um, a, a, a pandemic, a huge disruptor, uh, quite successfully as a, as, 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 a, as a leader. And we are now starting to see an upturn of the economy. Unemployment is coming down and all that. Still tough, especially with the issues of um, a, 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 the cost of living. Uh, so the, the principle of continuity, the principle of uh, gender equality, um, the policy conference was clear that uh, even amongst the top six, there has to be a semblance of uh, the demographics of the country and uh, the issue of, uh, of gender inclusion there is important. The third issue is the issue of uh, ensuring that there is uh, a, a sense of uh, handing over youthfulness, uh, that uh, it must be a generational mix. It can only be the 70s and the 60-year-olds, uh, whereas we have a youthful country uh, that uh, those that, uh, you know, the generations that, that are coming, the generations that will be the majority in 2024 um, electorate uh, must also come in. And the fourth uh, principle is that we also need to remember that uh, we are a, a nation uh, which is diverse that uh, we need to have the national question represented there. Uh, 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 and lastly, uh, but also more importantly, uh, where uh, we have huge numbers uh, uh, demographically of uh, our citizens living, the big provinces. And one of the big provinces is KZN. Uh, we also know Gauteng is the largest by, 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 by in terms of uh, uh, demographics. Uh, uh, Eastern Cape, Limpopo there, uh, Mpumalanga, you know, uh, without making anyone else feel that they're not important. But we also need to be guided by the population sizes. You make it hard for me to move on from this question. Um, having said all that, just going back to the president, really my last shot on the president. Yes. Um, with Even with Palapala, he still feels for you like the most stable leader to take the NC forward with 2024 in mind. Indeed, indeed. I'm going to move on. Thank you for that. Uh, yes, also within the principle of uh, continuity and also judging how he managed to rally us around uh, a pandemic uh, and that we emerge, you know, still a semblance of a nation despite the 2021 saga and all that. But I think we can be a, a winning nation still w despite uh, those experiences. And there's an upturn now of the economy from the work he's been doing on uh, issues of investment. We now need to focus on a productive country uh, and um, also the concept of uh, the district development model, uh, development the closest, model that they keep closest about. to where people live. Um, uh, uh, it's a model, the, the only model that 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 can work. I mean, as a, a previously an executive mayor in Tswane, we strived uh, for the local economic development trajectory to be um, to be the one that carries us. Uh, because if you know, municipalities also live on revenue. So if yes. you don't have a productive city. 
uh, the likelihood of uh, being a successful, thriving city is minimal. And and our economy was uh, actually local economy was growing higher than the economy of uh, the province and, uh, and and national averages. I want to move into into your politics at the moment. You're not on the ballot per se, but your name is. I think where go people still speak about you as possibly the next treasurer general of the ANC. What is your view on that? The fact that one, you're not on the ballot, but your name keeps coming up. Uh, maybe that's a battle that's likely to be won from the floor. What is your take on that? I, I, I really would like to thank all the uh, members of the ANC that have exercised their democratic uh, processes and rights to make a choice. And um, uh, and I specifically think about, there are about six, 600 votes uh, straddled between uh, uh, the deputy president, uh, the uh, national chair, the secretary general, <laughs> the deputy secretary general, and the treasurer. Uh, so I want to thank uh, those branches uh, throughout the country that uh, actually uh, felt that uh, uh, it is time for, for, for me to represent them. Uh, and uh, I acknowledge that I did say even at the time I'm raising my hand uh, and they, uh, if uh, branches so so fills, they can nominate. So beyond the, the, that, uh, there are about also 600 in the uh, ordinary member of the NEC. I think uh, uh, maybe uh, in the top 30 or so, uh, uh, in, the, in, in the 200. Oh, list, yes, to be an additional, yes. Uh, in the additionals. And I really, really am humbled. And um, I, I am even more humbled uh, by the nomination of women uh, because women are they are saying that uh, some of us must represent the voice of women. Um, if you think of it, uh, if, uh, things can't be any better if women don't speak for themselves. Um, as uh, the, dis- the, the, the people living with disabilities say, uh, nothing about us without us. It's not that it's not possible, but it will not be relevant. Uh, so it is important uh, that uh, in our constitution, we are building a non-racial and non-sexist and prosperous society. And women need to, to be uh, uh, recognized throughout. Okay. What position there are you more comfortable maybe serving in? If there are different nominations straddled across the different positions in the top officials, where would your heart be? Oh, yeah, I wouldn't mind to be the president of the country. <laughs> <laughs> we would have a woman president. No, I can't. I'm a woman who supports women. But I, would uh, have a woman I, I don't have a, nomi- a nomination there, and I support uh, the nomination of President Ramaphosa for now. Uh, however, on a serious note, um, we have consulted back with uh, especially women who have been uh, really providing uh, support, and uh, the the nomination that uh, they strongly support is that of uh, a Treasurer General, which I am uh, uh, available. Uh, That's to a hot take potato. Up. It is a hot potato, but uh, I had to think about it that, uh, you know, in the municipality, we've managed. Uh, billions of rents. Uh, we had to balance our books. We had to make sure that revenue balances with uh, e- expenditure. We have to, to make sure that uh, there's productivity, accountability. In the health department, uh, I was at the helm of uh, stabilizing even the finances, especially immediately after uh, the life as it issue. issue. Uh, yes, lots of uh, uh, service providers who had not been paid, some who were providing oxygen and whatever. We had to come up with a plan of uh, making sure that uh, uh, we make good uh, to our uh, 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 creditors and uh, also stabilize so that the services can recover. So you can't have recovery and renewal without uh, the funding issues uh, being dealt with. So it's a it's a critical issue. When I reflect back on the time when you came in to uh, be the Gauteng MEC, to come in after Tretani Matlangu, you actually reminded me now that you've also kind of been one of those people that the ANC relies on to clean up a mess almost. Because that wasn't the first time where, oh, there's a crisis, wait, call, do- call Dr. Gwen. Even now, <laughs> going to Lutuli House, it was a crisis that resulted in you being taken to Lutuli House. What does that make you feel? Because then you're not a first pick per se. You are a crisis management strategy. What is your take on that? 
I think it may be a talent, uh, it may be a destiny, it may be a um, live mission, whatever, but it has uh, certainly been uh, not been a uh, deliberate. Uh, but uh, at uh, those moments of history when called to assist uh, our, our people, uh, even in the municipality, um, as a mayor, I didn't contest. They said, come help stabilize. You see uh, what I mean? I did. Yeah. I guess it's this training uh, of uh, dealing with a crisis uh, as uh, health professionals. Um, you would want uh, people to you want to prevent a crisis. That's why you promote health. And if people are sick, you want them to come early so that uh, they don't complicate. If they are very sick and critical and almost dying, you then get into the drive of uh, life saving. Uh, and uh, that has also come handy uh, to me, especially from a public health uh, perspective, uh, for which I have uh, done additional training in over and above my basic medical training. So um, uh, it has been a role that uh, I have played and, uh, uh, and I've uh, also so accepted to play that role even now uh, we have uh, helped not where we are not where we want to be now as an organization but certainly we are much better than before um, we've had a very successful uh, policy conference uh, many people um, thought it would be disrupted and to fight to one another we didn't I actually um, thought can I just give my yes. five cents on that policy conference yes. I thought it was really micromanaged it didn't feel like a proper democratic process as we've seen them in the past I've been to ANC policy conferences it was a micro version of what an NC policy conference is. It couldn't it wasn't as robust as it could be. So when you're praising it now, I I I I refuse to accept your view. I think it's a it's a fellas you the NC put on a show. You made us buy into something that didn't feel legitimate. I'm actually hoping that the conference <laughs> does not feel like a like a farce. That's my five Tidi, cents. Tidi, um I don't understand what you mean. We did not uh, brief branches to behave in a straight jacketed manner. We didn't you you controlled which sedated. branches were allowed to go. You, you controlled which delegates were allowed to be there. No, no, no. Provincial we, leaders were complaining that their branches were not allowed to go. No, we, we just had to manage uh, the, the numbers. Uh, they were lesser. Uh, that I acknowledge, but uh, it was a free and democratic process. Branches uh, which uh, qualified, uh, they nominated their own delegates, we didn't choose. So it was an open, I think uh, the, the, the many people like yourself are shocked <laughs> that uh, it went so I well. You, you, you think uh, there must have been something uh, odd that happened, but no, I can assure you, we, 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 we over-prepared. We over-prepared for, for, for even policy. for the policy conference. We over-prepared, we preempted every uh, possible risk and we put measures in place to, to manage that. Uh, we are over-prepared for this conference as well. Uh, we have uh, opened it up. People are free to participate. We meet with branch with the uh, 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 the provinces regularly. We sometimes even meet with regional leaders just to make sure that everyone knows that it is their conference. And everybody knows that they are looking upon the ANC. Others think it will disintegrate. Others wish it well for renewal. And we're encouraging our members to go the path of renewal and give hope. Um, I, I, I want to speak about the gender issue. Yes. The fact that on the ballot as, as it stands, there are only two women in leading positions fighting it out for the position of Deputy Secretary General. The fact that it's only two women and it's for a deputy position, what does that say about the NC's membership as far as understanding what the ideals of the party are and what the party seeks to achieve? I mean, you speak really well of gender parity as an organization, but it's got to be followed by practice. And what we are seeing from your branches is that there's a disconnect there. Yeah, I fully agree with you that uh, we need to do more uh, to conscientize even our members around issues of gender parity. If you think of it, um, we have gone far uh, down the line as uh, the ANC uh, to even make it constitutional for the collective to represent 50-50 uh, gender parity. Uh, so I have uh, faith that uh, our organization is one of those leading organizations uh, in terms of uh, putting measures and mechanisms in place uh, to ensure that gender parity happens. Uh, however, we need to do more. 
And that is why we are now saying let's extend it beyond 86. Uh, let's make it uh, 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 including in the uh, top uh, uh, leaders. Um, we know that uh, uh, the late comrade Jesse Duwat, uh, may his soul rest in peace, uh, didn't stand back and say and said, I am a deputy. She was not a deputy um, a secretary general uh, to the secretary general. She was a deputy secretary general of the African National Congress mm. and that she executed her tasks diligently. Uh, and uh, she w- it was known that uh, she stands for principles, she stands uh, for policy and she was a fighter. And uh, she was with, with, for instance, I was responsible for uh, coordinating the NEC deployees in Bumalanga. Even when we dealt with uh, 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 fights even in branches to stabilize uh, Comrade Jesse Duat was uh, also with us. She came in person. Yes. So she showed that uh, whether whatever position you occupy, you can actually, uh, you know, represent uh, the best of uh, South Africans, even if you are a woman. Um, and more so if you are a woman. So uh, she's one of the women that uh, uh, we salute and uh, regret that uh, uh, she she passed on. I actually share your sentiments on Jesse. Um, I've like most journalists, I've had a lot of fights with her. But towards the end, her and I found uh, I had a really special relationship. I mean, I always speak about the last message she sent me just before her passing. Um, the the time that you've been in office in the secretary secretary general's office, yes. how have you been finding it as a coordinator? How are you navigating it? Um, do you want me to explain why I'm asking that question? Because I can. Please do. Um. There's always talk about dealing with the likes of Nomvula Mukoyan and Paul Machatile because part and parcel of being in a political space is that there's politics at play. And these are also people who are also looking to conference to emerge as officials. And so whatever work you do as the SGO regarding members and the conferences we've seen, there will be a lot of push and pull. And a lot of people have spoken about how they worry about whether or not you are up for the kind of battles that happen with people like that around. So how have you been finding it. <laughs> yeah, well, that's quite interesting. Um, I, you see, whatever I do, I try and be as diligent and professional and accountable as possible. And uh, one of my uh, principles is that uh, you must open it up, make it transparent so that mm. everybody else uh, can assess and judge. And that's how, how I've, 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 I've worked. Uh, I've worked with uh, both uh, Paul and Nomvula in Gauteng for many, many yes, years. Yes, of course. Um, I was uh, uh, Deputy uh, Chaperson, Deputy Secretary in uh, Gauteng, uh, ANC. I was also in the executive. I chaired uh, also a, um, a, a social cluster, uh, uh, which included uh, a, a department that uh, Comrade Nomvula chaired uh, as MEC, which was safety at the time. Uh, so we've worked uh, very cordially and uh, comradely, um, even during the anti-apartheid uh, period. So we come a long way with them. Uh, the important thing is, we, and we worked very cordially, um, there are campaigns that uh, I recommended uh, the a unit led by um, Novla take up, and she did. Uh, uh, there are recommendations she made to to our selves to take up, like uh, looking at the cost of living and poverty. Um, uh, you know, championing the uh, report on ESCOM and uh, putting pressure that the board of ESCOM must be held accountable and all that. So we've worked cordially on a number of uh, of, of fronts. Uh, however, there is um, a, a, an area which is uh, the issues of membership, issues of uh, uh, verification, uh, which Nomvula works directly with Paul on. Uh, and uh, but uh, over time we have agreed that uh, let them be o- open uh, and we dis- we meet with uh, the NEC deployees even when I was an NEC deployee before I came to mm-hmm. the SGO uh, I insisted I asked that we did a meeting uh, before the HQ does anything signs off we need to also have a say so we've opened up to all the NEC deploy so teams makes it easier. and um, also to to the provinces themselves yes we've had meetings with the the provincial leaderships and all that you open up and um uh, even now when there were problems with the uh, qr codes and all that we then established uh, 
a, a call center so that uh, branches can phone in and all that. And uh, that, that's that's what I do: systems, processes, and uh, transparency, so that uh, you know everyone takes uh, responsibility and ownership. Uh, okay. But those that are not happy, they are processes also of dispute uh, process. We've strengthened the National Dispute Resolution Committee as well uh, and some of the guidelines to, to just stabilize. Uh, but whether there's still any wrong that is being done, well, I think uh, if anyone has got uh, any evidence, they can put it through. We will investigate it and then deal with it. You, you, I am winding down. You, I was going to ask you, what would you do differently to help the ANC with its finance problems? You have spoken at length, actually, about your experience in trying to yes. stabilize particular areas, and that also speaks to dealing with financial issues. People speak about issues, ideas like crowdfunding, like the NEC becoming more involved in donor, um, in, in fundraising for the party. What ideas do you have beyond the fact that you're a process person and you understand what it takes to stabilize the finances? And I think you said something important that in order for the NEC to do what it's supposed to do, it does need stable finances. Are there any other ideas that you have to resolve the issues, more so with the Party Funding Act being the reality that you're working within? The first thing is that I've had a discussion with um, uh, TG on this matter, and um, uh, uh, and and so I, I kind of like understand uh, where we are, and he has also presented to the NEC as well. The second issue is that um, we need to uh, review party funding. I think South Africans must understand that the democracy is a cost. Uh, and democracy is also priceless and that we need to look at uh, what is fair to ensure that democracy should thrive, um, not only for the ANC, but uh, for political parties uh, in general. I think it was regrettable that uh, uh, there, there is a ceiling set uh, um, uh, low. Uh, so I, I would really strongly um, recommend that uh, uh, the parties in parliament should uh, review the ceiling that has been set um, uh, so that uh, political parties could be open, transparent and not uh, put themselves vulnerable for uh, the highest bidder uh, because the, it's, it's, it's democracy of the people. Mm. Uh, the, the other important issue is for the members themselves who can afford uh, to do more. Um, uh, there is already policy, but we, it is not being strengthened for members who can afford uh, to contribute, even if it is 10 percent of uh, of what you earn, uh, for uh, sustaining and stabilizing democracy. I think that would help. help. Uh, merchandise of the ANC could also be a, a, an area of uh, income and and so forth, so forth. So there are many other uh, possibilities, but uh, these have to be put through a. A, a committee fundraising or finance committee and taken through the organization. The merchandising issue, does that not take food out of the mouths of the many vendors who rely on selling ANC merchandise at events? It would actually protect them because uh, they would uh, be the ones who are authorized that would then be able to make a living out of it. At the moment, it's free for all. Uh, and oh. uh, even uh, those that don't have the interest of the ANC at heart, uh, who don't even need these merchandises um, are, are, are involved in that. It, I, it would stabilize the area. I did say I'm winding down. Um, what sort of a, an ANC must leave Nazareth in December? It must be an ANC that has uh, confirmed um, the 54th uh, conference resolutions um, that, uh, you know, some of, of that uh, uh, COVID having been disruptive, we need to consolidate the renewal agenda. Uh, we need to come out there uh, with the public believing that indeed we are committed to integrity, uh, to ethics, values and the principles and the historic mission of the ANC to serve, to be at the service of our people and that uh, we have a capable leadership uh, that can turn around uh, the socioeconomic uh, uh, situation currently and consolidate on the progress that we have made. Uh, 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 yes, indeed, uh, uh, an outcome that will inspire South Africans. It's a very tall order. We don't know if the NC can do that anymore, but thank you for your time. Uh, thank that's you, Dr. That's Dr. Gwen Ramukhopa, who's an ANC NEC member, coordinator in the Secretary General's office. But as you heard, she's also a name that's been touted as possibly the next Treasurer General of the ANC. 
Thank you so much. That's Dr. Gwen Ramukhopa, ANCNEC member, a coordinator in the Secretary General's office, but also a name that is hoping to come from the floor when the ANC's elective conference finally takes place. I'm excited that soon we're going to be bringing you a musical podcast. I'm very excited. The music of conferences, the music of struggle is something that as a political journalist, I feel privileged to experience at the many rallies that I've covered. But that we'll deal with another time. That's it from us this week. This podcast was produced by Dudu Zile Masuku and Amu Ramela. For Eyewitness News, my name is Tidi Madia. Mm-hmm.